I'm going to be talking about fracture. Um, before I do, just one comment that I can't that that was that was just prompted by uh, this morning's lecture by uh, Professor Delizola about uh, Lagrangians, and he said something which which is part of the folklore of uh, of uh, the calculus of variation that uh, you can't write uh, a Lagrangian for the heat equation, and I just want to. To, just to write something which has nothing to do with fracture, but just to provoke you a little bit. And uh, it, it, it doesn't contradict in any way what, what he said this morning. Uh, it actually shows, tells you the, the importance of uh, boundary and initial conditions. Because here I'm going to write a Lagrangian for the heat equation right now. So you have a, a domain omega, and you're looking for the heat equation over a time period zero t. And then you just take this. I'm doing it on purpose. Uh, sorry. This is Nabla. No, I'll write it differently, sorry. Um, just to make it look symmetric. Um, so I'll write it like this. So it's a function of x and t, but I just write the t dependence, okay? Okay. So this is my Lagrangian. Uh, you can check that it satisfies the heat equation. No contradiction, huh? But it's... Uh, so it, 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 which means that, of course, it really depends on what you you talk about when you're talking about the Lagrangian. Uh, okay, just a triviality, but you know. Uh, so, okay. Now I have a question for you before I start, because it, it's kind of important. How many, I mean, if you can just basically raise your hand, um, wh wh how many of you have a kind of background in uh, Calculus of variation from a mathematical standpoint. Okay. And how many of you have seen uh, variational formulations in elasticity? So about half. Okay. Well, okay, let's see how we can deal with this. So, um, I'm going to be talking about brittle fracture, uh, which is a propagation of uh, crack in an otherwise, let's say, elastic material. So uh, what's a crack? Well, I, I think you all know, even if you've never heard anything about fracture, you've all seen cracks. Uh, and uh, what's an elastic material? Well, I, uh, I will assume that you all know what an elastic material is, okay? So um, usually an elastic material is described by uh, an elastic energy. And um, so I'm going to, so I'm not going to do quite what Francesco recommended this morning. I'm not going to define right away the, the space of uh, admissible configurations, if you want, or admissible states. So I'm going to take W to be the elastic energy of my material, so that material occupies a domain omega, minus maybe the fact that there's a crack. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll, uh, I'm going to explain what I mean. So, so what, what is happening is that um, the material can break, and I'm going to assume for now, because 
this is what is being done usually in engineering and in mechanics, that the path that the crack can take is given to you a priori. So you know the crack is going to go straight, you know it's going to do something. So I'm going to call gamma hat the set, the, the putative set Of the, of the crack, uh, putative crack. So that is a crack. So the crack will be constrained for now to stay on gamma hat. I'm in a 2D setting. I could do this in 3D, but it's much easier to understand in 2D. But all I'm going to say throughout the, these classes applies to the 3D problem. Uh, so, now, if you have a crack and you don't do anything, you have a crack. Uh, if it's elastic, the crack is going to stay here uh, till the end of time. So in order to do something, you have to, uh, you have to do something to your material. Okay? So, so there is inherent in the idea of fracture with the idea of time. So you, you need, you need um, if you want your crack to, to, to move forward, uh, you need to, to apply loads. And by loads, I mean that they could be forces. What are forces? But here we're in elasticity. Or, uh, or, or displacement boundary conditions, or a mix of the two, that is going to make your crack move. So I'm going to, just for the purpose of these lectures, and this is, I'm cheating a little bit, OK? But, uh, and I'll tell you when I'm cheating, when I cheat. But I'm going to uh, assume that the only kind of loading that, I, that my, my sample is going to undergo is what's called the a hard device type load. So I'm going to call G of T. So I, I never write arrows on top of vectors. So I'll come back to this. So G of T is a vector field which is a priori only given on the boundary of omega, which depends on time, but which depends also on the position at which you apply that, that g. And this is going to give you the, dis the boundary displacement, if you want. And it's a function of time. So now um, I'm doing elasticity, and most of you have done linearized elasticity. I, once again, I'm going to cheat. So, it, okay, I'm not going to really worry too much about whether I'm dealing with linearized elasticity, finite elasticity. So I'm going to introduce my set of admissible fields. So, um, so my set of admissible fields is going to be, so, my, so I'm going to call a field, so a field is a transformation field, it's going to map at time t, it's going to map the uncracked part of the domain, omega minus so, what, so I didn't tell you what the crack was at time t. So crack at time t is gamma of t. The only thing I know about gamma of t is that it's assumed to be, uh, uh, to, 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 to be along gamma hat. So I don't have gamma, a part of gamma of t which is here. Okay. So my field is going to define on the, be defined on the uncracked part of the domain, omega minus gamma of t. And I'm going to assume, for those of you who are mathematically inclined, that for now gamma of t is a closed set, so that omega minus gamma of t is an open set. And it's going to map it into R2. Into R2 because I'm, I'm dealing with, with a two-dimensional problem. So, 
And my energy is going to be a function of the gradient, the nabla of my uh, kinematic field. So since my kinematic fields are mapped from R2 into R2, the gradient is a matrix. Okay. Uh, if you are doing with linear, if you are dealing with linearized elasticity, just so that you can catch on, latch onto something that you know. Uh, Phi of x is not the displacement. Uh, phi of x is the transformation, or I don't know what the um, the um, sanctified name is for that, but x plus u of x. So if you want, u of x would be the displacement. x is the initial position. x plus u of x is the position after deformation or transformation. <coughs> Okay. Um, if I'm going too slow, I can, you know, again, please. Yeah. Um, all right. So now, so I have this, and I'm going to call phi of t the solution to the elasticity to the elastic equilibrium. T. So, so, okay. so already here there's a huge assumption. I'm assuming that on, on what? On omega minus gamma t. So here there's a huge assumption. It's called the quasi-static assumption. So I'm assuming implicitly, or even explicitly, that somehow at each time the kinematic field phi uh, is uh, phi of t is such that it can equilibrate the uh, loads, which are just displacements. So by load, I mean both displacement and forces. But here, I decided just to have boundary displacement. At that time, for that configuration of the crack, gamma of t. So in particular, that means if you're, if you're a physicist, you would expect inertia to play a role. You would ex expect kinetic energy somewhere. And I'm assuming that somehow the process is slow enough that um, things equilibrate at each time. Okay? So with the quasi-static assumption, I'm going to say that phi of t is a solution to elastic equilibrium at t. So what does it mean? So if you're not used to variational things, what you write is you write the Equa balance equation or the Newton's equation or whatever you call it. So here it would be uh, uh, so f I'm sure you've all seen that the divergence of the Cauchy stress is equal to, um, to the applied forces in the deformed configuration, in the reference configuration. It's the, the Piola-Kirchhoff stress. What is the Piola-Kirchhoff stress here? Because I, I'm dealing with a hyperelastic energy. So hyper is just a word here, means there's an energy associated to my problem. Uh, <clears throat> so the, 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 the stress, the associated stress in the reference configuration is a derivative of the energy with respect to its, uh, its, uh, its, ver its, its entry, which is a matrix. So I'm going to call, I'm going to write it like this. DFW, so I'm assuming that W is smooth enough that I can define a derivative. So DFW apply at grad phi of t. So, uh, so W is a, it takes, so let, let's make, make it maybe a bit clearer. W is the elastic energy maps matrices into R. For now, we're, we're going to assume into R. Uh, we might have to discuss the issue of infinity if we're do, doing 
truly finite elasticity, but I don't want to do that here. So I'll assume that the energy is always finite. And F is a three by three matrix. So uh, I don't know how to write it, R three by three, okay? So, um, so F is a three by three matrix. So this guy, is, a, is for each value of grad phi is a matrix. It is a pure lucky of stress, and you take his divergence. And since I have no body loads here, I get zero. So the minus is not necessary here. Uh, and that's in omega minus gamma t. And please do stop me if you don't understand something. Sure. Uh, two by two. That would be, thank you, Julia. That, that would be good remark. So, uh, yeah, I'm thinking three dimensional, but uh, 2D. Um, so it's not maybe, it's surely you mean two by two, okay? Um, so now, uh, boundary conditions, phi of t must be equal to g of t on uh, d omega. I'm assuming here, maybe there's a difference with the notes I gave you, that gamma hat doesn't run along the boundary, just to make I'm trying to, it'll be simpler what I'm talking about now, what I talk about than what's in the notes. So, but it's pretty much the same outline. So you don't need to take notes. Um, but if you want to take notes, please do go ahead and take notes. Now, there's something which is missing, and uh, that's what Francesco was saying this morning. You, you, you have to know uh, much more about uh, balance equations and boundary conditions if you don't want to be, go variational. I'm going to go variational very, very quickly. But for now, I'm writing the classical thing. What you're missing is, so you, you've described the boundary conditions here. You have two boundary conditions, uh, it's good. There, you know, there's a heuristic principle that you need as many boundary conditions as dimensions. But yeah. uh, uh, in the in the in the target space, but here you have no boundary condition on gamma t. What are you going to write on gamma t? So here I'm going to assume that on gamma t I'm writing the following boundary condition. Here I write a vector, I like that. So where n is the normal vector here, it doesn't matter in which direction it is because it's zero. Uh, and that is, I'm assuming essentially that the crack, the boundary of the crack is stress free. That makes sense in one, in one setting and it doesn't make sense in another setting. If I take, if I take this piece of, this sheet of paper, I, I tear it and I pull on it like this, I have that kind of condition. However, if I take, imagine a, a thick book and I, I'm, or a thick slab of something and I'm pushing on it, then clearly even if it cracks, the, the crack lips are uh, touching each other, and you should write something. I don't want to get into this. Um, so I, I'm not getting into the issues of either friction or contact of the crack lips or uh, issues of what's called non-interpenetration. So I'm going to assume here, although I'm in 2D elasticity, that first of all, there's never any, there are never any forces that are uh, due to the contact of the crack lips. That's one thing, and I'm going to assume even more, I'm going to assume that they can kind of interpenetrate, which of course is nonsensical. But why, why do I do this? Because, I, because this is an, an additional obstacle which brings nothing to what I'm going to talk about except complexity. So I'm trying to aim at uh, maximal simplicity, not maximal complexity. Um, of course, once again, I'm tricking you because there are issues that are not completely resolved when you add 
uh, non interpenetration or things like that. So you, you, um, for those of you that are really uh, uh, interested in that issue, at the end of the course, I can give you references. Okay, so these are my, and I hope I didn't forget anything, uh, these are my equations. Uh, on both sides, yeah, yeah. On, on, on. If you want, uh, what should I write it? Gamma t plus minus, with the the idea that uh, you know I call plus and minus the the, the crack lips, whatever plus is and minus is. All right. Yeah. Um, so the first thing. So, that, so that's, I haven't even started talking about uh, uh, cracks yet. But um, so here I have to, ass I'm assuming you know. If you don't know, you learn because I cannot get into this now. So I'm saying that this is, this whole set is equivalent to saying that phi of t is a minimizer for the following integral, integral over omega minus gamma t of w of grad phi dx among what test fields? Among, among all phi's and I'll come back, I'll, I'll say something about mathematically which fees. All fees such that phi equals g of t on uh, d omega. And as Francesco, um, so there are two issues here. First of all, is there such a minimizer? Second, if there is such a minimizer, is it, a, is it, does it solve those equations? So, uh, so is there such a minimizer? I'll talk about it in a, in an insta, in a minute. If you have this statement, I say that if you follow what Francesco talked about this morning, you will get exactly this. Okay? And the reason essentially is very simple from, uh, you know, borrowing from his uh, lecture. The reason is that on d omega you've given boundary conditions that are displacement or deformation boundary condition. Uh, um, okay, so let's make it clear that for me a deformation is not the same as a strain. Okay? So deformation is a field strain is the gradient of the field or the symmetrized gradient of the field if you're talking about linearized elasticity. So um, you have boundary conditions here on the omega. However, you have no boundary conditions on gamma of t. Since you have no boundary condition on your states, on your admissible states, you get a complementary boundary condition, which is exactly the one that I wrote here. Okay. So that's kind of in a nutshell where if you minimize this, then you get that. Now, why is there a minimizer? So that's, so that's a mathematical problem. And if I don't tell you a little bit more about G, about W, there's no reason why there should be a minimizer. So I'm not going to say much about this now. There is a class of elastic energies for which you have uh, you, you, you have to, you can minimize this. Uh, now this class has been discussed, discussed ad nauseum in the past 30 years. Uh, leaving aside for now questions of, uh, of non-interpenetration and so on, uh, you, the class, for example, a good class is called the class of polyconvex functions. If you don't know what polyconvex functions are, it doesn't matter. Assume W, for example, is C1 and strictly convex. Okay, so a WC1 strictly convex uh, will, will do the, well, okay, not enough. And then you need, 
you, you need some growth and coercivity properties. I hope those words mean something. So for example, so I'll just write it here, and, and you can always ask me questions if you don't understand. So for example, the W, that would be C1, strictly convex, strictly to ensure uniqueness of phi of t, although there's no reason why it should be unique, uh, and W of f, which, grow, which grows and is bounded below by alpha f p minus, um, whatever, uh, minus uh, 1 over alpha, and uh, beta f p plus alpha plus 1 with uh, alpha and beta positive finite p greater than 1 and less strictly than infinity, that would ensure is that if g, g of t has the right properties, that is uh, uh, g of t is in some trace space that I don't want to talk about. Also for those who want to know maybe w1 minus 1 over pp, of the omega, provided omega is Lipschitz also, Lipschitz domain, uh, then uh, you have a solution, unique, phi of t, unique solution, which would be in W1p of omega with value in R2. So whatever, if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Uh, if uh, you should say at least that uh, convex energy is against uh, frame indifference. Convex energy is against frame indifference. <laughs> I said it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So there's okay. So here is. So I'll tell you the the the. the I'll tell you something which I was trying to hide, but he's, uh, Professor Del Piero is forcing me into it. Uh, so, one, convex energy is against frame indifference. So let me repeat it. So, of course, if you don't know what frame indifference is, then, then it means nothing. It's a meaningless statement. Uh, you can think you know what frame indifference is, and you don't know what frame indifference is. That's also an issue. I think that's my situation. I think I know what it is, but I'm not sure I know what it is. Uh, and the second thing is that, uh, um, okay, here is the issue. I'm doing this with gradients, and you, you, th you must be thinking, why is, it, why is he bothering us with those energies? Why not do linearized elasticity? And the reason I don't want to do linearized elasticity, which most people call linear elasticity, is that when you work in linear elasticity, you don't work with gradients, but with symmetrized gradients. And when you work with symmetrized gradients, formally, everything goes through. However, however, when you're trying to do mathematics, and I'm going to do a little bit of math, you get into a lot of trouble. So we are now in a situation, 15 years after this business started on, on, the variational, on a variational approach to fracture, where from a mathematical standpoint, we have better results in a finite elasticity setting, non-convex to satisfy frame indifference, than in linearized elasticity where we still don't know how to do it. Also, numerically, as I'll show you later, it works very well. Okay, so, so, I'm, so the convex is kind of the medium gro middle ground which satisfies nobody because it's not frame indifferent, so it has absolutely no application in nonlinear elasticity, and, uh, from the st and it, so it's completely useless from a, an engineering standpoint, but it's the easiest setting. Uh, it has some mathematical problems. Oh, yeah. Could you tell which one? Not, not right now. I'll tell you a little bit later. Yeah, um, not right now. Okay, so this is 
For now, I still haven't talked about fracture, and uh, I've talked for a half hour, but that's okay. Uh, so another 15 minutes, and maybe I can talk about fracture. So now, okay, so if the crack was sitting where it is sitting, this formalism, if it's, it makes any sense to you, would be sufficient. But the crack is moving. So since the crack is moving, uh, you have to write something to tell you that tells you how it moves. And that's where the contribution of Griffiths in the 20s, that's 1920s, uh, was completely essential. So Griffiths, uh, and now I'm telling you about Griffiths' model. So the Griffiths model is, is the following. There are other models. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it, about them. But Griffiths' idea was the following. It said, he imported essentially two ingredients. He said, when you break, when you move the crack forward, you're, you're breaking bonds between atoms. So you're spending energy. You're spending energy. You have to feed your system energy in order to move the crack forward because there's a barrier towards, uh, against moving the crack forward, which is that the, ato the, the, the bonds, the atomic bonds, don't want to, to, to break. So you, you're, you're, you're spending some surface energy. But when you do this, you're releasing some elastic energy. Uh, this is something which seems a little bit obscure when you haven't heard about it. But look, just think, uh, you understand this, I think, very simply. Uh, imagine, so you see, and here, the variation of viewpoint is essential. Uh, when you say phi of t is a minimizer among all those test fields, that means the energy that you're going to spend at phi of t is minimal among all the energies associated to any of those phi's. Now, let's say you increase your crack you, you, for the same load, g of t. You increase your crack. Suddenly, what happens? You increase the number of kinematically admissible fields. You increase the number of test fields. If you increase the number of uh, fields over which you minimize something, you decrease the minimum. So if there was no surface energy, it would clearly be to your advantage to increase the crack length. But the crack length, but you spend energy increasing the crack length. So somehow in Griffith, Griffith's first ingredient is to say the energy which is released, or rather it says there should be a balance. So it should be such, the crack should be such that if it is sitting here at this time, it should not be to the crack's advantage to go forward because the amount of energy that it would gain from an elasticity standpoint would be offset by the amount of energy it would waste uh, creating surface. So that was his first ingredient. The second is ingredient is what is that surface energy? And what is that surface? And so, so the first ingredient, okay, I'll go back to this, but uh, the second ingredient is what is that surface energy? And here, Griffiths had a very simple idea. He said the surface energy should be proportional to the number of broken bonds. Maybe that's not the best energy, but it's, uh, it's kind of logical. Uh, you know, you say, you know, I break one bound, I spend so much per bound, per breakage. Per so if I break one bound, I, I, I spend $10. If I break two bonds, I spend $20, if I sp and so on. Okay, so then, um, once you know, once you admit this, then in 2D it's fairly clear that the surface energy should be proportional to the length that you add. So the amount of surface energy that you would, you would, uh, get, you would, uh, you would uh, uh, have to spend to, to increase the crack by this much would be proportional to the length 
of this crack. And the coefficient of proportionality has to do with this value of the, how much it costs to break one bond. Okay. So those are the two ingredients. If you put them together, you get what's called Griffith's criterion. So the first criterion is to say, is addresses essentially, so first of all, your surface energy in 2D is like K for, of, of a crack gamma, of crack gamma, is K times the length of gamma. I'll write it like this for now, okay? And secondly, you have to have this balance. So he decided that it should be an infinitesimal balance, that essentially when you move forward, you release energy, and it should be less than the energy you're going to spend. If you do that, and you go to the limit as a crack length, the add crack length goes to zero, you get that if I define by uh, g of t minus the derivative, okay, so I forgot to, to you, here you have, okay, so phi of t is a minimizer, you, I'm going to call p of t, for potential energy at time t, the value of your minimal energy. I write it script p because it's prettier. Okay? Now, that's a function of t, but not, a, okay, that's a function of t, but really it's not only a function of t, it's also a function because here, there's nothing that, that is so specific ab about gamma of t. Actually, this gamma of t, I should, and, and in the notes, it's like this. I shouldn't call it gamma of t, but I should really call it gamma of L of t. What, what does that mean? That means that once, um, I assume, let's say, the crack is connected, so if at, at time t, I'm here, I call L of t this length here. And more generally, if, I have a, if, if I'm here, so maybe I'm making a mess, uh, if I'm here, there's a length L, and I can define gamma of L. Gamma of L is, is the geometric site of the crack, which has length L. So really here, I shouldn't write t, but L of t, and here it doesn't matter really that I take L of t. I could have done it for any crack length. So really I should replace gamma of t by gamma of L and subsequently replace everywhere t appears in gamma by L. Okay. Because for, for now, in all that I did here, uh, the crack was... Uh, uh, the crack was um, f the crack length was fixed. Okay, so now my um, my potential energy is really a function of t and l, and here it's an l. And what I'm going to and what I'm trying to find is l of t. So that's the goal. And what Griffiths is telling you is compute the following thing. Minus dpdl at t l of t. Compute the derivative with respect to the crack length of your potential energy and you evaluate it at the solution. At the solution it should be such that, and that's just an infinitesimal balance between surface energy and uh, elastic energy, it, it's not in your interest to move forward. That means that it's better, that means that the derivative of this guy plus k um, or, uh, the, uh, is, should, should be less or equal to k. In other words, if, if I write this, it's like writing that increasing the length from L of t would cost me more in terms of surface energy than I would decrease in terms of elastic energy, right? I hope you see that. So, um, so that's the first thing. 
this object here is an object which has a huge, uh, which, which has been hugely important in fraction mechanics. It's called the energy release rate. So that's the first statement. The second statement, which which is what, what happens is t. So that that tells you that constrains somehow what L of t is. The second statement is what happens. Can can you, can you close a crack? And implicitly, at least in mechanics and in, in civil engineering, and with the kind of materials that we, that that people deal with when you know in structural engineering and so on, not so much for you know sophisticated gels or things like that, where it might not be true, but it's it's true that generally with T, that L of T grows with T. If you have a, if you have a crack, it stays there forever. That doesn't mean that. Let's be very, very uh, clear. That doesn't mean the crack is open. But it's there. You don't spend any more energy to open it again. That's very important. It's not true, probably, for some more sophisticated modern materials like, uh, 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 I don't know, gels. Whatever. Okay, the third thing is when are you going to decide that a crack can move forward? Well, it's going to move forward if and on, only if, only if um, the energy release rate is maximal. G of T. Um, minus k or plus k. Uh, a g of t is always less than k, so g of t plus minus k l dot must be zero. Why not plus uh, g? Uh, yeah, no, 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 it's because I, I have G of T, that's why. Later on, I'll forget uh, that notation. So that says, unless L, that the only way that L dot, L dot, by dot, I always mean time derivative. The only, the only way that the crack can move forward is if G of T is K. Because if G of T is not K, then the L dot must be zero. So that's called maximal. Energy, or, or that's not cold, but I'll call it maximal energy release rate. Okay. So, this is Griffith's idea. So, it's the three prong criterion. One, that G of T should be less than or equal to K at L of T. Second, uh, G, second L dot of T. Second, that the crack grows with time. Second, that the crack can only grow if the energy, the, the energy release rate is the maximum that it can be. That is the basis of fracture mechanics, engineering fracture. So if you look at a book on engineering fracture mechanics or fracture mechanics, this will be embedded in, in there, although you might not see it, but it's there. It's always there. Okay? Now, of course, and I'll end up with this because I only have two minutes left for today. Of course, there has been great progress in fracture mechanics since this time. Um, uh, the kind of energies, surface energies that people consider are complete, are usually, I mean, could be much more complicated than the idea of what's called cohesive surface energies. Uh, you, th there is, um, you, you, Non-interpenetration plays a role. Uh, there's some ideas about dynamic fracture, uh, but the core is here. And just to finish, since I have one minute, just to finish, uh, I do have one minute, right? I do have one minute. Um, 
here, here is the, the kind of, so, so this has been usually successful. And if you tr try to Google things on fracture mechanics, just with the title of fracture mechanics, you probably get, I don't know, 150 million uh, or 100 million quotes on Google. Uh, however, one thing which is clear, and I'll, I'll tell you more ne uh, next time, but watching one, one thing which is absolutely clear here, I think, is that you see at best you have one equation. At best. One equation. At best. Now, imagine, for example, that the crack was always, forget about your reversibility, imagine that the crack was always a line segment. Okay? Always, starting from, if the crack starts from here, it can be a line segment, and all you need to know in order to know the crack is the position of the, of the, the end point of the crack. In 2D, you need two equations for the position. You only have one equation. So even if, the crack, if there was no irreversibility in this model and the crack was a line segment, those, this, those kind of equations wouldn't be unable to deliver the position of the crack. And so this is the main focus behind what I'm going to try to explain to you is the idea of how can you predict the path that the crack is gone to take using variational arguments. So that is the, the squarely the focus of my talks is crack path prediction. And I will be able I will be willing to kill anything that stands in my way in order to focus on that particular point because that's what I think the main issue in fracture mechanics is to predict where the crack is going to go. The rest is details. Okay? Okay, thank you. So tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow. <laughs>